Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us here today for yet another Capital Insider series. Uh, today, we are actually going to talk about how innovation is happening in the gaming genre, and today, uh, particularly with the, you know, while the lockdown itself has gone uh, from the government side, but we are still really all in lockdown as we sit in our homes and do most of the work that is required. Um, and gaming, particularly, and entertainment has been on the a real upside, on a real rise in these last few months. And today we are talking to Saloni Sehgal, who's the general partner at Lu uh, Lumikai, and she's going to tell us about what she sees uh, is probably going to hold for the future of gaming, entertainment, and interactive uh, entertainment industry in the times to come. So thank you very much for joining us, Saloni. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Um, indeed, there's been a big upsurge in gaming and entertainment in the last few months. And while we've been, we've been all learning to work from home, we've always been also been very busy trying to learn some new games and you know just try some new means of entertainment. Essentially, leaving the television behind and um, trying to look into far more other uh, areas of um, entertaining ourselves. So, um, you know, my uh, first question to you really is that. Um, there's just so much happening in gaming today, you know, while it was, uh, I know about three years back, I, we were still only talking about board games being on mobile phones, but today, you know, uh, there are trends like cross-platform cross uh, experiences, um, in-game socializing environments. In fact, you know, uh, I was talking to um, somebody in the gaming industry last month, and uh, he told me that, you know, this is probably also going to be the new social media for a lot of people to actually come and uh, communicate with each other and hang around. So what, what kind of gaming trends are you seeing at uh, Lumikai happening in the industry, and particularly from an Indian perspective, because you, you are so focused on Indian uh, yeah. gaming startups and Indian entertainment startups. Yeah, yeah so, you know, for so us... What trends are you seeing there? So for us, it's a really interesting time, uh, Ritu, in the market. Uh, and if you, you know, just take a step back and if you look at what's happened in the market in the last, let's say, 24 to 36 months, and, you know, we all know the stats, you know, it's the 300 million gamers, it's the 450 million smartphone users, it's the cheapest data rates in the world, the highest data consumption with one, nine, an average Indian consuming nine gig of data. And through that, gaming has become an ultimate beneficiary and COVID actually accelerated that. The amount, you know, as of April 2020, there was a research report that was done and it's at 67% of India's millennial audience are active gamers. And those numbers are phenomenal. Those numbers are something that we haven't previously seen before. And there were two large supernova events. One was obviously the geo 4g introduction and the second right. is obviously you know controversial as it may be but pubg's uh, phenomenon which essentially unlocked monetization and kind of moved away from that myth of that oh indians don't pay in games it kind of unlocked that yeah. and it became a phenomenon and you know when we've tra traced at lumikai when we've traced the gaming sociology and the digital sociology of users we've discovered some very interesting insights about india's gamers versus the rest of the world and you know the first uh, key insight that we've seen is that other western markets had very linear progressions and introductions to towards gaming you know they had the arcade games then they had the uh, consoles they had the pcs they had the mo mobile that came about and then they were in very slowly and gradually introduced to different business models in gaming, whether it was the box games, the paid games, the premium, the free to play, and then subscription. For Indian users, there are hundreds of millions of first time mobile users who have now come online and they have experienced social media, they've experienced messaging, they have uh, experienced gaming, audio, video chat, all at the same time. And at, at Lumikai, we call these users, you know, digital convergence natives. And to some extent, their digital sociology is very different. You know, so they're inherently social, they're inherently multiplayer. And any kind of such new paradigms which will appeal to this audience has the ability to, to really scale. And there are some kind of thesis areas and trends that we find deeply interesting. Uh, we feel you know, one is social social gaming. So there's a high degree of openness towards social multiplayer platforms in the country. There's also 
uh, we are very interested in regional language gaming users. You know, very fun fact, but uh, Tamil gamers and Tamil you, la, speak, you speakers were the fastest growing uh, gaming uh, users for PUBG, in fact. And, you know, so there is, right. there is a lot of uh, interest. There's a lot of demand. And, you know, that correlates to what you see on YouTube because 90% of video consumption on YouTube is actually done in regional languages. So, but there is a complete dearth of content there. And we, we also very interested in original IP, original Indian storytelling. We believe Indian storytelling is just coming of age and it's only a matter of time that it leverages games and gaming experiences to tell those stories. And we're clearly seeing some studios now embark on those journeys as well. And of course there are, you know, the broader, broader platform plays, the tools, tech and the infrastructure plays around gaming that we find deeply interesting as well. Sure. No, I absolutely agree with you. And particularly the multiplayer platform has been quite a phenomenon. It's been a rage during this time. I mean, we've seen the growth of Ludo King as a, uh, you know, a gaming platform become so phenomenally large. And it's, it's so simple. It's essentially Ludo being played with people on the phone. So yeah, that's, that's something, um, um, you know, we're waiting to see more, much more to happen uh, uh, with people. So, you know, uh, mobile uh, typically for the use of games has become a very important platform. I mean, you know, uh, but do you really still feel that as uh, the games become more interactive, as the number of players increase, do you think the experience of gaming uh, or uh, enjoying the game on a phone uh, would be the real, uh, or, I mean, you know, would be the real trend? Or do you think people would still love to use an iPad or they would love to use a laptop or a PC? to play a game and actually take its entire experience better. Mm. So, you know, clearly, and we're seeing this now, mobile has, you know, ha has unlocked a, a large audience for, let's say, you know, gaming in itself. You know, gaming earlier was a, you know, niche fringe activity, you know, with you and you would have to have expensive hardware to be able to game. The mobile really transformed that. And clearly right now out of a $160 billion dollar gaming market globally, 80 billion is contributed by mobile. And you know, that is the fastest growing category. And we don't see that really changing. And now with a mobiles have also become much more powerful, right? So you can get those gaming experiences on your mobile phone. And there is a lot more accessibility with it as well. And now with a variety of game engines out there, cross platform porting is totally possible as well. Now, whether you chose, choose your a mobile as a games platform or not largely depends on what is your target market, what is the genre of the games, and what is your developer comfort? What are you comfortable building on? And there's no denying the fact that mobile has had the great, greatest and largest reach. We are big believers of mobile as a key entertainment device. It, is, it has opened up demographics where non-traditional audiences who didn't necessarily self-identify as gamers picked up the mobile phone and started using and playing games and have made that their personal entertainment device. And only right. mobile can allow, allow for that kind of demographic expansion to happen too. Sure, totally agree over there. And I mean, but I mean, you know, on another, on another level, when you think of uh, games like, uh, or you even think of platforms like Highland, or even if you think of platforms which are international platforms like Minecraft or Roblox, do you really feel that they can also be as a uh, can be experienced well on a mobile, or do you think it would be much better, or they need to sort of change their um, entire platform to be more mobile friendly? I I don't think it's a either or. Uh, because there are enough and more immersive games which are on mobile, which deliver a certain kind of experience. And then there are these immersive platforms which are on, on PCs and consoles which deliver a certain kind of experience. And it's never uh, one or the other. The genres that they target can be different. Uh, the categories of gaming that they're building can be different. And that is the beauty of gaming in itself that it is incredibly deep and there is a massive breadth of experiences that you can have, have. And mobile clearly is one of the platforms which can deliver that. Now, for example, you know, if you're building hyper casual games and that's your area of expertise and interest, the mobile is the perfect device for it or whether it's even, you know, RPGs. And we've now seen, you know, Supercell was obviously the pioneer in building these 
uh, immersive games, uh, mid-core games on the mobile device and delivering these fantastic experiences which have been played by hundreds of millions of users across the world. So clearly there is a place for each of these mediums and there is a premium which is now being paid for convenience and accessibility which we can't deny. Totally. Um, so there's another genre of gaming which sort of became very big uh, just prior to the pandemic, which was fantasy gaming, and you know, with uh, with more you you becoming more interactive with the real on ground sports that were happening. And while we are of course fingers crossed that the IPL sort of uh, delivers on its promise uh, as it goes live now. But I mean, what what kind of uh, challenges have been faced by uh, the fantasy gaming startups in this time? And you know. What, what would you advise to them? I mean, given the fact that there's only going to be a slow progress for on-ground sports to still come, uh, you know, or to see the era that it was seen prior to the pandemic. So uh, what do you, what, what is your take on fantasy gaming? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. So clearly fantasy gaming was one of the categories that was hit the most in the absence of live sports. And clearly it has a seasonality impact as well. So, you know, the existing... Uh, players in the market were either resorting to, let's say, nostalgia content or rewards and giveaways to be able to have, you know, still retain users on the platform. And it is definitely very challenging. Also, you know, fantasy is an interesting space, which already has a very obvious incumbent, which it, which we all know is now demonstrating its financial muscle. And, you know, you talk about the IPL uh, sponsorship, which is very interesting because if you you know, trace the historical sponsorship of the IPL, you will notice that the de facto industries in trend for those years were always sponsoring the IPL. So, you know, whether when it was real estate, it was DLF, when it was a smartphone boom, it was Vivo, now it's gaming and it's, you know, Dream 11. So clearly it's the golden age for gaming overall. So, you know, my advice to players in the market who are, let's say, you know, not don't have the either financial muscle or the power that uh, the incumbents have to take them on it is the right time to look beyond fantasy towards other genres which don't necessarily have incumbents yet and build out in those categories so go after the spaces which are underserved untapped and this is a great time to navigate through that because you know this is frankly also from a investment point of view a great vintage year to invest in startups because the startups that will get built in this, the next two years are are going to be the market leaders of the future. Sure. So there's some. Uh, so there's uh, Subahu Jain who is asking uh, right here that you know how can somebody invest in the gaming industry? So you know, like us, uh, not as a fund, but probably more. I think maybe as an angel investor. But what is your take on it? You know, so uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, in our experience, investing in games is not like investing in the consumer internet space. You know, games investing is incredibly specialized. It is requires a lot of specialist understanding and insights. This is also the reason why there is an emergence of sector focused glo gaming funds globally, which have emerged because there are a couple of problems that are associated with gaming, right? You know, most investors use a problem solution framework when they look at gaming, uh, when they look at in uh, startups, you know, what problem does the startup solve? Now that framework totally breaks down in entertainment because does the world yet need yet another match three game? Probably not. Right. And the only, the biggest problem that game developers face is boredom, which is not necessarily a problem per se, but it's a byproduct of the fact that we're in, a, in an attention economy. So, you know, evaluating those startups is, is really requires some specialist insight. And also the second is that, you know, it is important to understand that you're backing teams who understand their audience, who understand the nuances of building games, because being focused in gaming can often lead to very large outcomes. And that is really important as well. And, you know, everybody says, you know, games is a hit driven business. And we, we say, well, so is venture capital. So you need to have a portfolio approach and you need to have the right portfolio of games assets across categories, across genres, across the platforms to be able to, you know, identify the winners and then support and catalyze them. So, you know, my, my advice is that uh, see a lot of deals in the, in the space before you make your bets um, in order to get an understanding of what the landscape looks like and what is your personal uh, preference and 
capacity to be and, and risk appetite. Okay, so Saurabh is asking, um, how can in-app purchases be improved for games, which is municipal right now? That's, a, that's another great question. Um, you know, it is a function of, often content is, a, and ga success in games is a function of the kind of content, the kind of retention and game mechanics, and then the ease and accessibility of, pay, of the payment infrastructure. So, you know, all three are very important components of being able to monetize on games and doing it well. Now, clearly we have seen examples of in-app purchases working in India with uh, games which have deep monetization mechanics and with the not and the payment infrastructure which is still evolving in the in the market it is a and and for us when we are looking and investing in games companies we know that capital is one of the problems that game developers need to solve for they need other inputs and insights as well they need access to talent they need access to understanding what are game design best practices they need access to the right partners publishing clients and all of this uh, goes well and hand in hand together to be able to improve the performance of the games in themselves and then the companies post that and that is a process and that is something that companies learn over time and we're hoping that you know once we see the unlocking of whatsapp payments and all those other payment infrastructure issues being resolved this this will solve uh, over over the years sure so one of our editors is asking that you're the one of the world's first female general partner of a gaming fund um, so do you think there are enough females who are finding, uh, you know, who are founders of gaming companies today? Or do you, do you think we need to do something to have more of them? Well, clearly, if it's 2021 and I'm the first female general partner of a gaming fund, I think the answer <laughs> li lies in itself. Clearly not enough. I think it took us by surprise uh, as well. And, uh, you know, we... And gaming, but this is a problem of larger tech. I think this is a much larger and longer conversation to be had of representation of women, both as, as entrepreneurs and as well as in the investing side, particularly in India, which is clearly there is a shortage of. And this is something that we are obviously mindful of. We There are a few uh, teams that we know who have mixed gender teams who are female co-founders, and that's fantastic. In fact, one of the key questions we ask startups when we're investing in them is that what is the diversity of the team? What is the gender ratio? Um, and those are very important questions for us because when, especially when you're backing in entertainment products, it's very clear to us that entrepreneurs and financiers need to look like the audiences who are consuming those games and entertainment experiences. So you need to have that representation within your companies. And that's always going to be a uh, work in progress for us, but that's very uh, clear, um, part of how we think about investing as well as to back diverse teams. Sure. Um, so we've got another question on Facebook Live uh, where they're asking what, what is the fund size that you offer to the startups that you are looking in gaming? So one she's asking that. So we look, um, again, we are very early stage. We have the uh, capacity and the stomach to go early, at least for gaming. So we will do check sizes of anywhere as low as 200,000 up to even as high as $2 million uh, with, with capital for follow on. That really, obviously the higher check sizes require, it will depend on the kind of company, the genre and the conviction on the bet. Uh, but that's essentially the, uh, the range with which we invest. We are very comfortable doing pre-revenue bets. So we look at pre-seed seed bets largely and that's, that's the way we, op we operate. Sure. And I mean, have you recently done some investments during the time of the pandemic in some gaming status? We will be announcing our investments next quarter. Sure. So there is Debya still who's asking that the ban on PUBG was a big boost for Indian developers. However, South Korea parent company is trying to enter India by serving, by severing its ties with Tencent. What according to you should Indian game developers do to continue growing even when PUBG returns? And uh, how do you how should they keep their users and or grow their users? Yeah, you know, that's, uh, it's an interesting, um, I think, uh, you know, one is that PUBG was very important for the ecosystem from a perspective of the nascent esports ecosystem, the streamers, the influencers that had come through and their return augurs well for that ecosystem. It brought a lot of attention. It started bringing a lot of brands 
non endemic brands into the ecosystem so that was obviously a, a good development for the industry i think on the other side as well now is a great time to make original content and there is also as i mentioned earlier you know now is the golden time, age for gaming there's clearly a lot of global interest there are a lot of global capital coming into the market a lot of the large corporates are making moves into gaming so if you're an indian developer now is a good time to start really thinking about the kind of games that you want to build and the kind of content that you want to build and if you want to build investable companies you need to think beyond a single game and a product you need to think about building a business and how do you do that what kind of talent that you need and then go out and cap raising capital for that and now we seeing entrepreneurs come to us with some very ambitious ideas and that's that's very heartening to see that clearly there's there's appetite for that and um, you know india the indian developers traditionally have been undercapitalized you know in the last 5 years there's been un, let's say you know 350 million dollars less than 350 million dollars which has been invested in the space majority of it in one company and majority of it in the last 24 months but there is a massive uh, develop, development developer scene in ecosystem which is now growing because in the last 5 years we know that from 25 development studios now there are 300 plus and there's a further underground community of an other additional 1000 indie studios who are you know tinkering and building games of their own and that's only a good thing you just mentioned about diversity do you think we have enough uh, female developers uh, who are in the gaming industry today would actually um, seeing well obviously you know it's it's definitely there's a stem problem where you know the number the representation of women in even engineering colleges is very low so clearly there is a problem there uh, but there are more and more women who are in gaming building games companies who are either part of mixed gender teams or who are also you know founding their own games companies that we're seeing clearly it's a minority but it is definitely an improvement over the last few years where i've tracked the market and there were mm-hmm. you know you barely you know you could count them on one hand we are, we definitely see a lot more women coding as well and you know we we get profiles of people who are developing their own games and they're not ready to be funded at the moment but it's really heartening to see these you know w- women programming their own games and you know coming up with these ideas whether it's a one person or a two person shop and there's definitely an uh, an uptick i would say it's not there's nowhere it's nowhere equal but there's definitely a, a slight improvement for sure for sure um i mean you know now today i mean since you mentioned do you think that uh, putting gaming uh, as a subject in school entertainment uh, you know uh, education and gaming coming together gamification of education we've been talking about it for the last two years but you know we yet to see a lot of uh, content or even let's say lot of interactive content for children coming in that direction so clearly there is an opportunity there but do you see this content being done in india or do you really see that first it's going to probably be in some other part of the world you know so, so gamification and game mechanics as means to drive retention and engagement have been clearly well established and they're clearly that they're being leveraged as well you know to some extent even like a byju's for example does use certain you know game mechanics uh, to be able to retain uh, their their users and we're clearly seeing that and in gaming is a fantastic way to actually teach certain skills because there are abilities like your visuo spatial reasoning skills your problem solving your collaborative skills so we're always on the lookout as a fund as well to look for these similar experiences which can be contextualized we know and we look at games from a from a portfolio approach you know so whether it is uh, looking at categories and genres from gamified learning experiences or language focused gaming experiences or whether it's educational focused gaming experiences we're always on the lookout for those and we do believe that there are companies currently in india who are ideating on that space and who are leveraging familiar and well and new mechanics to play with engagement and and retention in in their apps Sure, and I mean, do you think it's something which is going to get as well as school is getting into schools, and you know, there be actually classes or classroom teaching happening through gamification? Do you think it's going to become that mainstream anytime soon? We d- we're definitely seeing it gro- globally. There is a uh, you know, a, it's very interesting. There is a company called Prodigy which builds mathematics games, and clearly, globally, classroom uh, teachers are using this. 
to teach math skills to kids from the age of 8 to 12 and they're being wow. encouraged to play these games uh, in as part of their school curriculum so we're clearly seeing this globally and this is a trend that we only expect to see accelerate of course developers need to think about how to make safe learning experiences for children whether it's safe virtual environments for children and that is the next step of evolution and we clearly and we clearly saw that you know with minecraft and roblox which have become massive successes and the large part of their user base is is children or teenagers within a certain age group and that's already happening totally um you know now we are also seeing a big corporate play also happening in gaming today you know there is of course fun on sun bun side the likes of sony and samsung who are uh, you know coming out with new products and then of course there is google and microsoft amazon who want the pie of the gaming industry too and then of course we have the entire startup community who is doing so much work in the gaming industry so do you think that because of this corporate play do you think the startups it's going to be a gainful market for the startups or do you think it might just hamper startups somewhere and you know they might instead of taking initiative choose to be part of a larger corporate and uh, so they, that might slow down the whole progress of gaming on a individual level so so not at all um, i believe you know the more the merrier the industry has uh, been under capitalized and it requires the supports of these giants to come in to encourage and catalyze that innovation they will bring that risk appetite and they can't do it alone you know they will need to partner they will need to uh, do publishing and they will need to acquire and all of these are very good steps for the ecosystem because all of them will in some way or form infuse liquidity and in build that risk appetite to create those contents those platforms those tools and techs that can be leveraged for the domestic ecosystem so we actually see that as a good thing and if you're a content developer at in in the current uh, ecosystem and if you have skill ambition and skill you, it you're in, you're in the right place and and we will expect at least a few acquisitions this year or next year to to come through which will further infuse liquidity into the system and we we quite anticipate that as well so you know it's it's only a good thing so within what streams are you expecting these acquisitions to come forward i think it's are going to be those product software what I, exactly both product, uh, you know, both product and software related. So acquisition of capabilities, acquisition of teams, uh, acquisition partnerships, publishing deals. We will definitely see a lot more activity over the next twelve to twenty-four months in the Indian gaming space. Sure, and I mean, you know, you you're very excited about interactive uh, gaming and interactive inter entertainment yourself. so particularly within in, uh, interactive entertainment as a space what what kind of trends are you observing and you know what do you see growing more so you know we we touched upon it uh, a little bit i think in interactive if we look at um, every industry from a little bit of a step back we try and look at con within content we look at various genres so whether it's your hyper casual your mid core um, and other categories we we look at or original ip we look at across genres then we look at various platform plays whether it's a verticalized platform play or a horizontal play where you know you've got now the mpls and the windows who have now raised capital and who are well capitalized we look at those spaces as well we look at tools tech so anything that can enable um interactive media we we look at that and then there are infrastructure plays you know uh, around cloud streaming etc while it's still very early days we have an eye open for india specific solutions around that as well and what's more interesting to us is that there are kind of entrepreneur personas which are now coming and building in the games industry space has been different to that of the past you know the past you had the gaming 1.0 entrepreneurs you know the people who really struggled and built their games companies and leverage very familiar game mechanics whether it was a rummy the teen patties uh, and they built solid profitable businesses out of that now you have a two separate kind of personas of entrepreneurs who are entering into the uh, who are looking to now build the first is you know the kind of experienced uh, product manager or experienced founder who has exited a company now and coming from ancillary industries or adjoining industries to build gaming and then the third is finally the kind of gen z founder who has grown up playing a clash of clans game or grown up playing 
Minecraft or Roblox who have a very deep understanding of an inherent understanding of how social mechanics play out in game mechanics. They are now coming in and building products and games and they are the ones taking the boldest bets. So we find, we find that very interesting and those are some of the insights that we're seeing on the market play out in the ground. So there's Satyajit on Facebook who's asking that, do you believe we need to introduce technology skills in education at an early age? Uh, sorry, I missed that question. Uh, Ritu, I may have to ask you to repeat it. Uh, uh, so do you believe we need to introduce future technology skills in education at an early age? Absolutely. I mean, uh, the idea is to raise, yeah. Ab absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting that back in the um, 1990s and 2000s, there was a game development institute which was set up in, uh, in the US and Jay Leno came up on, uh, you know, primetime television and he said, congratulations, now for the first time there is a course which is even more irrelevant than other courses, it's on video game design. <laughs> and, and look at 2021, gaming is a $160 billion industry and it is only becoming even more mainstream and game designers and game developers are some of the most coveted skill sets that you can get globally. And as technology improves, as demographics who come to gaming and social experience start expanding, uh, this is, it is the future and it would be futile to fight it. And hence introduction of coding, programming at an early stage is, is definitely very, very important. Sure, totally agree. And, uh, you know, so uh, in terms of the, uh, the pandemic's been hitting businesses hard across categories, but I think gaming still sort of managed to stay afloat and people were still hooked on games and entertainment during this time. How has this time been for your startup or your portfolio startup? I mean, you know, while I can, I can totally imagine that the users might have gone, but monetization may have been hard to come by. So what advice have you been giving to your startups? And, you know, have you been investing in them to ensure that they still get longevity? Of course, given the fact that the entire gaming uh, industry is seeing the uprise, but what, what have you been doing or how have you been working with them? Yeah. So, so Ritu, I've tracked the gaming industry for a very long time. You know, I've seen it through multiple stock markets, the crisis, economic crisis, where's the global financial crisis and the crashes. And our hypothesis going into the pandemic was that even though currently gaming is at an all time high in terms of usage, monetization and adoption, even after that gaming, once gaming usage would normalize, so to speak, it would still, still settle at higher peaks than pre-COVID levels. And that has largely been proven out. COVID's digital acceleration, at least for the India market, has meant that there, there were a lot of non-traditional users who adopted gaming for the first time. And there was this market expansion that happened. And now when people have gone back to work or people are you know, now slowly getting back to their regular lives, gaming usage may have reduced. But the companies that we've been talking to indicate that the revenues have largely held up to some extent. So that validates uh, our, our thesis. So we have actively invested. And even though we are seeing that normalization happen, it has still rested at higher than pre-COVID levels, which has meant that the market has expanded in a certain way. And we don't foresee that switching back. Sure. And are you also sort of particularly for you know, uh, gaming startups who might say, I need another round of funding? and it's not easily coming from the rest of the market. So are you also going in further rounds for your existing startups as well, or are you looking at newer startups? We're, we're currently in the first phase of our deployment. So we're looking at obviously coming in as primary capital at the moment. Uh, we are not at the stage where our startups need follow on investments. So, you know, hmm. for us, we're still at the point of deploying our primary capital. Right. Okay, thanks so much, Saloni. This has been a great talk. And, you know, I think there have been questions still coming in. But I think due to the lack of time, we'll probably stop here. But I think this is wonderful to see how the gaming industry and the gaming platform is going to emerge into a much, much bigger industry. And probably, you know, uh, our, our trip with internet really started more when e-commerce became the thing and i think the second risk is really with gaming because you know we uh, like to now spend we've 
so it's really how you've taken the entire television time into gaming which is very interesting to notice and i think it's only likely to increase further so any last words from you to people who should come and enjoy the gaming uh, experience you know i mean gaming is the only kind of interactive immersive experience where it takes you out uh, it takes you out of your world in a in a, in a in a fashion that no other entertainment can replicate so you know i have great appreciation for the industry i've been in the industry for a long time and you know i'm very excited for what the future holds for for the india market and for india's creators sure thank you very much saloni for joining us today and if for our audience both on facebook as well as on zoom if you have more questions please keep on uh, putting them on the facebook link we'll try to get saloni to answer them though of course she's getting bad so congratulations for that and uh, but we we'll still love to see you having and talking to you more in the industry and hopefully next time not in front of a screen but in person thank you very much for joining us today sir thank you so much ritu thank you all right thank you bye bye everybody